Imagine this scenario. You get caught up with the wrong crowd, which leads you to being in the wrong place at the wrong time. That ends you behind bars. That's the story we've got today. Ashanti Witherspoon was once in a maximum security prison with no chance for parole. He was gonna spend his life behind bars. But God intervened and spared his life behind bars so that his purpose could be lived out to help other people that were also prisoners. This is much like a movie, but it's real and you wanna see it from the man himself. Ashanti Witherspoon has one of the best stories of redemption I may have ever heard. Uh, you're going to meet him today as my friend and fellow co-laborer in ministry with Christ, but it wasn't always that way. He was a hardened criminal, gang member. So let's start with your early life. You grew up in Chicago, had somewhat of a, a normal start to life. Then your parents divorced. Your heart began to change into somebody completely different. Yes, because I had people or friends who were around me and they would talk about their fathers, their mothers, and you know, family life, and my family life was different. Mm -hmm. And I had an aunt and an uncle who moved in and they had been living up in the, the Washington, D.C. area. When my mother and father were divorced, they moved in with us because we were living in Chicago and my aunt was saying, wow, she doesn't need to be raising three sons in the city of Chicago. After that, and you began to harbor resentment, even though you were doing okay in school, you were smart, you began to, in your own words, drift. When you were 11, against your aunt's wishes, your mom let you go live with a cousin, which really began to crumble what foundation was left of your home. Tell us about that move. My aunt had been fighting against it for the longest and I put pressure on my mother, was constantly talking to her, just letting her know, look, you're my mother. She's not my mother. She can't tell me right. I can't go over and spend the night there. If it's all right with you, I can go. And I kept putting a pressure on her and then finally she agreed to it. And when I left out the door, I heard them talking, she said, I hope this doesn't happen, but you might regret this move for the rest of your life. That changed everything. When we went over there, the neighborhood was hardcore. My cousin and I went around the corner to meet some of his friends. Then one of them, he introduced me as his cousin, the one who knew karate, and they were really excited about meeting me. And one of them jumped up and said, let me see what you know. And when he threw his hands up, well, you know, I took him down real quick. And then after that, you know, I kind of became concerned because another larger guy jumped up and said, let me see, you know, he's smaller than me. Let me see if you can really handle something. So I took him down real quick. Then after that, another guy came out and he was actually the vice president of the group. He's one of the leaders. Of one of the top gangs in Chicago. Yes, yeah. And they asked me that I want to join the club. And I just said yes. And the next thing you know, you're in a gang. Right. Not long after that, not only are you in the gang, you had become the leader of yeah, the gang. Of one of the branches. And how was your heart changing from this 11-year-old boy to gang leader? What was happening? I mean, you, you, you say you drifted, but you drifted quickly. My whole life and the people I was surrounded with were different and all of them had come from broken homes. Well, then later on, as this behavior escalated and you're taught more and more how to become this hardened criminal, you have a shootout with police. In Shreveport. In Shreveport, Louisiana. We were out and I was going from one section of the city to another section of the city. We stopped to get something to eat. And when we did, I turned around and I said, man, this business is closing and there's no one who's here. And in my mind, I'm on the run already. I said, I can just go on and rob this and continue on to where I'm going and what I'm going to do and I'm going to be leaving the city in a few days anyway. And when we stepped out, the guy who was driving the car, he was in front of the restaurant at first and he left so he would be out of the way. But when he drove down the street, the police had stopped him. When I, stopped, when I stepped out and looked and saw that the police had stopped him, the other guy who was with me said, man, let's run down here. I know where a parking lot is that's full of cars, and we ran down the street, went to steal a car, and then the police started coming because somebody had called and said that somebody was out here trying to steal their car. And the police came through the parking lot, and it was two of them. One came across the street. He was driving real slow. I guess he was looking at everyone who was in the parking lot, trying to see where we were, and another one's coming through the drive-through of the parking lot 
right in front of us. Mm -hmm. And that's how it triggered, right at that point. And what happened, the shootout started taking place and then I ran out of bullets and I was running down the side of the, the shopping center. And as I was running, all the police that were out there just started opening up and a bullet went through my body and I did a flip. The gun flew out of my hand and I had bullets in the other hand. I didn't see where the gun went and I was bleeding and I didn't really know where I was bleeding from. I know blood was just running out of the lower portion of my body. And then as the police were taking up positions around me and aiming, they kept saying, where's the gun, where's the gun? I would raise my hand and I kept saying, I don't know. Then they had another police officer who came up and he was running down the lot and he stopped. He pulled a gun out and he had it aimed and he looked around to see who was out there. Then he aimed and then he fired. But by that time I was kind of laying on my back and I turned my head and he hit me on the right side of my face, traveled upward into my head and stopped inside my temple. It stayed in my head though. It's, it's right behind my temple right now. Still there? Yes. I went to court, was tried and convicted and sentenced to serve 75 years without the benefit of parole, probation, or suspension of sentence. And then uh, when the appeal was finalized, I was sent to Angola, which at that time was classified as the bloodiest prison. So then you're there, you look like, okay, this is my life now. No opportunity to get out. What's your mentality? Militant, radical, and I was believing that everything that I did was right because of my mentality at that time. Mm -hmm. After a while, the prison started allowing ministers to come down to tear at least once a week, and it was a group of them. And they would minister to all of us who were in the cells, and they would always leave us Christian literature for us to read. And as I started reading the material, I started remembering things that I was taught as a child about Jesus, about God. Finally, one of the guys came by and he gave me some material, and this time we really talked. So as a result, this particular day, and every day, time before they would leave, they'd ask me, did I want to give my life to Jesus? And I'd always say, no, I'm not ready yet. So you did accept Christ, and you went on to become part of the ministry team, and you began, yes. your heart began to soften. Right. And I became involved in practically every education program. And after a while, they saw this total change that was in me, and I was helping. I would say a definite God moment for you would be when you were asked to be a part of the Emmy Award winning The Farm, where because you had become a leader, they asked you to be in it. I met the producers and they flew down from New York and they said, we want to film you everywhere, but we promise not to film you when you're taking a shower. Well, the success of The Farm was seen by so many people that it ended up earning you the opportunity to be paroled when you otherwise would not have had it. And the law changed and said anyone who was convicted of armed robbery, if they have a sentence of 30 years or more, that after 20 years and they reach the age of 45, they should be at least allowed to appear before the parole board. Now that wasn't a guarantee that you were going to be released. Well, by that time I had done so much in the prison because they had allowed me to start traveling out in society, and I was speaking in schools and use my testimony as a means to deter young people away from lives of crime. You know, we developed a CPR team, and so we were saving lives in prison and teaching people how to save lives. And that was your ticket to get out, was to go and take that ministry and prevent others from going to prison by using your story. And so you have been ministering for how long now? Well, I've been out of prison for 19 years. What has your ministry been like? I mean, it is obviously born in the heart because you've been there. Well, I'm heavily involved in prison ministry yes. and reentry. When people are getting ready to get out, help them find jobs, places to stay, mm -hmm. you know, help them through the initial months right. or the initial year or so. And for a while, my wife, Susan, mm -hmm. and I had people who had been incarcerated over 20 years. If they were getting out, they would come and stay in our home and we would work with them. And so they were in a family setting and they got a chance to say, okay, this is the way a family's supposed to, mm -hmm. supposed to live. And it was always mandatory that they had to go to church. The best way to be the church is to go out and be the church. How do you tell people to do that? And how are you doing that? Well, I generally start with my testimony. Yes. And my testimony generally pulls them in because I also tell them that I have a bullet in my head and if I'm speaking to young people, if I'm speaking to anybody, I'll pull a plate out of the roof of my mouth and let them see this large hole that's inside my mouth because a bullet hit me on the right side of my face, traveled upward, and it stopped right inside my temple. As a Christian, you know, you pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide you 
and what you want to say and you find you a jail or prison that you can go into and be willing to work with the people. Now that might not be what God has for you, but you have to ask God, what is it you would, you would like for me to do for you? We've been here today with Ashanti Witherspoon and you've now heard one of the greatest stories of redemption I've ever heard from prison to pastor. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for sharing your story and uh, thank You're you welcome. for the ministry that you do. Thank you for having And thank you for being my friend. <laughs> I'm so glad you got to see that story. You'll agree there's hope for every prisoner. And Ashanti is on the front lines helping those one-on-one -on -one find self-sufficiency. Go to lifeonpurpose.tv to learn more about how to help and support his ministry.